Paul reminds us in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The word of the Lord to live and to share. Thanks be to God. Well, change is in the air, isn't it? You can feel the seasons transitioning. Uh, this week it's been beautiful every morning, nice and cool in the 60s or so. And then we've had just wonderful days of, you know, not getting much above the 80s. Um, you know, I've started to see, you know, colors of the leaves are slowly starting to change. I'm not ready for it, but some are even starting to fall in my yard. And I'm not overly happy about that, but it's, but it's happening. And then, of course, the, the real, you know, thing that signifies to us that fall is here. You know, Starbucks has started selling their pumpkin spice latte and... You know, on Hall of Fame, they even have their own turn lane now into Starbucks. Did you notice that? <clears throat> so <laughs> I share that as someone who gets a bit more frustrated when I have to change lanes. You know, what, what's so exciting about Starbucks as people are backed up in the street? But, but really, really, things are changing. And, and it's an exciting time of the year because now we've come to that season that comes around not just once every year, but instead comes around once every quadrennium. We've come to election season. And everyone is getting in the mood and in the excitement with bumper stickers and flags and yard signs and red and blue streamers and I I just had to get in the spirit this past week and so I turned on and, and had in the background while I was writing my sermons and while I was thinking and and I, I put on my favorite you know election holiday channels you know the ones Fox News and CNN and MSNBC and and I watched on my favorite, you know, election holiday programs, you know, to just really drive and get in the election spirit. You know the shows, um, Grown Man Yelling, you know, the one where you want one man's journey to set a record for how long you can yell at a camera without breathing. And, and then... Um, and there's another one, you know, between two red faces. Uh, it, it, it's where one moderator is stuck in a box as, you know, two people explain why the other person and their ideas and their thoughts, you know, are going to bring about the end of the world. And, and then there's, there's another show. There's the, you know, what are we mad about again? Uh, it's where a bunch of panelists, you know, are, are together and they all, they're all talking and they're talking and they keep talking and they get angry and angrier. But by the end, they're a little bit confused about what they're mad about in the first place. Uh, I just love these shows. <laughs> All joking aside, you know, I, I, I've discovered as I, as I watch the news and as I uh, listen to opinions, uh, I see not all but a lot of dialogue that, that really leaves quality conversation, quality discourse. It's lacking in quality discourse. And as I shared last week, you know, one of my concerns is we see that not only in national media, but we've seen that trickle down into our conversations as well, into our social media, into our conversations with friends and family and loved ones. And so that's why last week and this week, uh, I felt that it was important to spend some time talking about uh, our faith in addressing the political divide that we experience in our country, in our communities, in our families. How can we as a people of faith have political conversations? And like so many things in life, it starts, if we're going to change something, it starts with us. And so that's why last week I, I talked about how it's important for us to look at ourselves in the mirror, to be willing to take off the jersey, if you will, and realize that politics isn't a sport. It's not about winning and losing and to stop seeing one another as opponents, but seeing ourselves as, you know, fellow citizens seeking and striving uh, to better our community, our state, and our country. 
And then from there, this week, I'd like to talk about, so what does that begin to look like? How can we approach those conversations then as people of faith? In case you didn't listen to last week's or you weren't with us, uh, you can go back and find that online. But I do just want to make again a quick disclaimer that I will not be telling you how to vote or who to vote for or what party you support or what policy you should support. I won't be telling you how I vote or what policy or parties I support. Uh, There's legal reasons for that, but also um, I want to be your pastor. And I wouldn't want to do anything to offend you all. And and I wouldn't want to do anything to make you feel like you were any less valued to me or any less valued to God. And I know that, that you all take that serious. My parents take that serious. I talked about them at the beginning of last week's sermon, and now they're sitting in the front row this week. So, you know, at 35, they're going to make sure they still have that chance to be in eyes range, you know, and give me that look if I need to go a different direction. No, all kidding, really. I, I do want us to be able to talk about this serious conversation. How do we as a people of faith address the political divide in our midst? So as we begin, let us do so with a word of prayer. Gracious and loving God, I do give you thanks for this chance we have to come together as as friends, as family, as a church community, and to ask questions about how can we discuss very serious and difficult topics such as politics and do so in a way that glorifies you. And so God, I pray that you would be present with us as we gather together remotely and in person. May you be present with each and every one of us. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Oh Lord, fill me with your spirit. Use me as a vessel. Speak through me to share with each of us your message of truth and grace this day. Amen. So first of all, I think it does begin with where we ended last week. We ended last week by, I hope, establishing and stating that our one true foundation, the only thing in our life that, that it has earned and deserves our complete loyalty and complete dedication isn't a politician or a political party or a specific policy. It's our, our, our Lord Jesus Christ, that Christ is our foundation. And, and I think when we're able to start with that, as we begin to approach conversations with others, we do so with a completely different mindset. Because if we're willing to approach others acknowledging that I'm not defined by my politician, I'm not defined by my political party affiliation, I'm not defined by a specific policy I support, when we disagree, then I'm not going to take it as personal because you aren't attacking me personally. We just disagree on a specific topic or who we support. It's not something that I can, should you know, get as angry and, and upset about if I am not defined by who I politically support. But so why have these conversations? I know some of us, we might think to ourselves, you know, why can't we just follow that rule that so many of us follow at family reunions? You know, just don't talk about politics. You know what? Why should, we willing to, why should we have those conversations? Well, first of all, I do want to acknowledge if there's anyone in here or listening right now who, who has previously, currently does, or will at some point in the future serve as an elected official, there's obvious reasons why you need to have those conversations as you seek to understand the will of your constituents, as you hopefully have conversations with other elected officials across, you know, all, all you know, spectrum of, of beliefs and, 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 and policies so that you all can together hopefully unite in, in finding and discerning what's best for our community, for our state, for our country. But, but understand that as I'm talking today, I'm thinking more about us, you know, plain Janes and average Joes, you know, as we, as we seek to carry on political conversations. You know, what are some of the reasoning for why we should and, and how we might do so? And, and our initial response might be, you know, our, our, our gut instinct, our, our knee-jerk reaction might be, well, we carry on political conversations so that I can convince someone else of why I'm right, they're wrong, and why they need to vote as I do and believe like I do. But that would, again, be putting on that old, you know, putting on the jersey and team mindset that we're desiring to get away from. You know, our conversation isn't to convince someone why they're wrong, convince them to join our side, or to convince them to to, to vote as we do. That would be, again, winning and losing and seeing ourselves as opponents, and you've got to join my team in order to, you know, be correct and to have any value. That's, we want to get away from that. So if we get away from that, if we take off our jersey, the, the conversation has a completely different purpose. The conversation, when we discuss politics with others, be that a coworker, be that a friend, a family member, a fellow church member, When we have a political conversation, the purpose isn't to convince someone to join us. The purpose is to better get to know them, to to offer a caring and listening ear, and to also allow them to better know us as well, to grow together as a family, as a community, as a society, to deeply care about and get to know one another. 
So think about how that mindset changes the conversation completely. Instead of being, here, let me tell you why you're wrong. Here, let me tell you all the things that I think are right and how you should think. When the conversation is more about how do we get to know each other, the conversation becomes more along the lines of, so how long have you felt that way? Was there any specific experience that led you to believing uh, or supporting that policy? So what is it about that politician that really attracts you to them and, and led you to vote or, or is the reason why you plan on voting for them? Is there anything about their policies or that the party you affiliate that you don't agree with? Anything that you wrestle with and struggle with? You see, the conversation is completely different. It doesn't come from a place of anger or judgment or condemnation. It's, I want to know you better and know your positions and know the policies you support and the politicians you vote for. I want to know more about you as a person. And then we have the opportunity to authentically share about ourselves. You know, if, if I'm not coming at someone with anger and animosity, but I'm generally trying to better understand them, there's a likelihood then they're going to be more likely to willingly and patiently listen to me, to ask me the same questions. So what do you think? Do you agree with me or do you, do you, do you follow it, vote for someone else or have a different policy that you support and why? And so where are some of those places where we disagree or are different? Were those some places where we're similar? It changes the conversation completely. And, and, and I believe it'd probably be much more enjoyable in that process. If we can approach it from that perspective, you may actually find that you like having political conversations when you remove the anger, the animosity, the judgment, and the condemnation from the conversations. One thing I share, and I think is important to add here, and I think it's applicable, one thing that I share with, uh, with couples when I go through premarital counseling, or if a married couple comes to me and, and they just need some pastoral support with, a, with a, a, an, an impasse that they're having, uh, one of the conversations I have and I share with them that I either tell them or remind the couple is, you cannot read your significant other's mind. I mean, that sounds like obvious, right? But, but it's important to point out because so often we think we do, we think we can. So often we use things like, well, you feel, or you get angry when, or you don't like it when, or you only like, or the only thing that makes you happy, we use all these statements as though we know how our significant other thinks, feels, what they believe, but we can't read their mind. The only thing that we can speak about is what we think, what we believe, how we feel. That's why when we talk about relationships, we talk about the importance of using I versus you statements. I think, I feel, I believe because that keeps us in the only arena that we can speak authoritatively on, our own thoughts and beliefs and feelings. Now, the reason I share all that is because I think that's important not only for marriage and for you know, relationships, uh, romantic relationships, but it's important for all relationships as well. And it's important even when we have political conversations because so often we think we can boil someone down based on the politician they support, based on their party affiliation. We think we can boil down exactly who they are, what they think, and what they believe. You know, you see a Biden and Harris bumper sticker and you think you know what they think about um, productive rights, reproductive rights. You, you see a MAGA hat and you think you know the ins and outs of that individual's stance on immigration. But you don't. You, you just legitimately don't. And you can't know their mind. We are all built upon such so many layers of knowledge and experiences and faith that the only way that you can truly know what someone believes and how they feel and what they support is by asking, by having a conversation. In the same way that anyone can really say or know what you think and what you believe is if you're willing to humbly and honestly and authentically share. Here's what I believe. Here are the truths that I hold on to. Here's what I think is best for our community, for our country, for our world. So I, I hope you understand this is why I think it's important for us to have these conversations because we're called to love and to care for one another. And so that means getting to know each other. But there's also a secondary and benefit to having these conversations. Not only do we get to know others, not only do they get to know us, we also get to know ourselves. You know, sometimes we can be reductionist towards one another. Okay, I'm going to reduce you down to just a couple of statements or a couple of key things that I think you believe or ideals that you hold. But the truth is we can also be and likely oftentimes are just as reductionist for ourselves, just as simple, you know, minded towards ourselves. You know, I, I'm, I follow that political party because, well, my parents did and my parents were for that and my parents were for that. And that's, that's just, that's the reason I'm, I affiliate with that party. 
I'm supporting that politician because, well, all my, all my friends are as well. Oh, I, I follow that policy because, well, it just, you know, it had a cool slogan, you know, and it just kind of got my attention. So that's why I'm voting for that policy. But when our, our positions are that simple, that basic, then our political support is, it's shallow. And so if we want to actually be intentional about our politics, if we want to actually give them the time that they deserve and the importance that they should play in our lives, well, then we need to be able to think critically about our own positions and the politicians we support and what it is that we believe. And having these conversations helps us with that. Because when someone else begins to ask you, so why are you voting for them? Why do you affiliate with that party? What is it about that policy that speaks to you and makes you think this is what's best for our community or state or so on and so forth? When you have to begin to answer those questions, you've now got to look at yourself and your policies and the things that you believe and you vote for. You've got to now look at them with a critical eye. Proverbs, 20 t- Proverbs 27 tells us that as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens the wit of another. And I think this plays out perfectly well right here. A major reason that it's helpful for us to have political conversations is to better know ourselves. Until you are willing and able to talk to someone, especially someone who disagrees with you, and have to share why you believe what you believe, then you're in danger of your politics being extremely shallow. If you want to give them depth, be willing to talk about it. Be willing to defend it. Be willing to describe why you believe what you believe. I think if you do so, then we'll become even more and more secure in our own stances to a place where we don't have to get defensive when other people disagree with us because we're secure and comfortable in our own skin and what we believe and what we desire and how we vote. Now, I know saying all this and talking about this may make it sound like it's kind of (laughs) simple. And believe me, I know it's not. (laughs) I know that talking about it in this way and just being, oh, yeah, if you just, you know, if you just ask nice questions and you're kind to each other, you know, everything's going to be great. Yeah, I understand that that's not the case. Uh, I understand that as we as we talk with one another, there's a good chance that you're not going to have an experience where the other person is going to say, you know, hey, you know, we have just... We have found the, all these wonderful places of connection where we really do agree and we have the same goals and desires and, you know, we're, we're going to join in a circle now and sing Kumbaya. Like, I know, I know that's likely not going to happen and be the result as you have political conversations. I, I, I doubt you're going to have an experience where someone says, you know, you just so kindly and compassionately shared with me your thoughts and asked me my own thoughts and beliefs that, you know, I know you're not asking me to do this, but I've decided I'm going to change my vote. You know, I just... <laughs> I so appreciate how eloquent you were. I mean, no, that's, that's not going to happen, or at least probably not that melodramatically. <laughs> but, but, but hopefully there will be places where as you carry out these conversations, you will find some connections. You will find some maybe one or two points of agreement. You will find that you have similar, similar goals and desires. And, and, and at the very least, even if you still find yourself disagreeing with each other, which is probably very likely, at the very least, you will have become more comfortable in your own thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and why you vote and practice politics the way that you do. But I want you to know these are going to be difficult conversations, but these are difficult topics. These are important topics. Why would converse about the, conversing about them be easy? But as we have them, as we talk with one another, especially when we find ourselves disagreeing, it is as important then as ever that we take into consideration who we are to be as a people of faith. It's important as ever that we think about the words that Paul shared that Pastor Cindy read for us just a little bit ago from his letter to the Colossians. You heard there in that letter that Paul writes, he tells the Colossians, he tells us, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness and patience bear with one another and if anyone has a complaint against another forgive each other just as the lord has forgiven you you also must forgive above all clothe yourselves with love which binds everything together in perfect harmony and let the peace of christ rule in your hearts so so we hear that scripture We hear what Paul's saying, and I I don't know what you take away from that, but for me, I hear Paul saying, you are a beloved child of God. And so is the person sitting next to you, the person down the pew, the 
person listening on the radio, the person watching on the live stream. So is the Republican, so is the Democrat, so is the person who doesn't vote and doesn't care. Everyone, each and every one of your beloved children of God, start to see each other through those eyes. See one another as God sees you and share one with one another. Clothe yourself with the love of Christ and share with one another the grace, the forgiveness, the humility, the peace that Christ has shown you. You know, for me, one of the main reasons we probably don't have these conversations is because we're afraid. So we're afraid. I don't want to be judged. I don't want to be condemned. I don't want to say one little thing wrong and then everyone jumps on me for it. <laughs> I just don't want to. So I'm quiet or I only talk to people who I already know, believe just like me. Or I stick to just some simple points, some simple bullet points and I don't really go in depth on anything at all. But don't we desire forgiveness from others when we make mistakes? Don't we desire to be given the benefit of the doubt from time to time? Don't we desire to be given the space to think about and to work through and to articulate our thoughts and our beliefs? Don't we want that for ourselves? If that's the case, we've got to be able to offer it to others as well. As with so many things, we can't control how others act and say what they say and what they do. We can only control ourselves. And if we want a better dialogue, if we want more compassionate, grace-filled, and peaceful conversations for the betterment of our community, for your family, the betterment of your place of work, the betterment of your social media, it's got to start with you. And for me, that means we have to see each other, especially those who disagree with us. We have to see them as beloved children of God. And we've got to be willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. We've got to be willing to give them grace and forgiveness. We've got to be willing to give them the space to articulate and to work through their thoughts before we jump on them for every little thing they do wrong. Yes, it's important to hold each other accountable. But at the same time, it's important to share with one another the grace and love that Jesus has shown us. That means when you look at that politician that you are not going to vote for, when you think about that other political party, when you think about that uncle who you vehemently disagree with, you've got to see them as a child of God. You have to choose. It's a choice. You have to choose to believe that they also love this country and her people. You have to choose to believe that they also want what's best for each and every one of us. You've got to give them that benefit of the doubt. You've got to be willing to hear them out and show them the grace and love of God. If we can't do that, then we have no hope of changing the discourse in your family, in your community, in the world around us. And I'm going to stop there. <laughs> I think we could go on and on, and we could do this for weeks. But that'd probably be my last piece of advice. Don't talk just about politics. Like I'm telling you, <laughs> I'm telling you to be sure to go out and have political conversations. Don't be afraid with them. And, and, you know, enhance the dialogue and the conversation that's happening. But at the same type, time, also have other hobbies and talk about other things. And I know that there's more that we can say, but maybe I'll come back and we'll talk some more about it in four years. <laughs> But for now, I, I hope that this isn't an end point, but I hope it's a good starting point. I hope you've got a few little nuggets that you can hold on to, that you can maul over, that you can pray about, so that then you can maybe say, okay, this is important. It's not what defines me, but this is important. And so I'm willing to step in there in faith and to have grace-filled conversations about the politics and the direction of our country, our state, and our community, because that's who I'm called to be as part of the family, as part of God's creation. So to recap, take off the jersey. This isn't a sport. We aren't on different teams. And make your foundation Jesus Christ above all else. Do not make a politician, a party, a policy. Do not make that your foundation. Christ is your one and only foundation and build everything upon who he calls you to be. As you enter into these conversations, 
do so not to win someone over, but to get to know them, to know what they believe and what they think and why. Be willing to humbly and honestly and authentically share who you are as well. In the process, you just might strengthen and secure your own political beliefs, not so that you can harden your heart in some way, but so you can become more comfortable in your own skin and what you believe and why you vote. And make sure that in all things, clothe yourself with Christ so that flowing through you is his grace, his forgiveness, his compassion, his love, all the things that he has shown you, be willing to show them to the rest of God's children, no matter their party, no matter who they vote for, no matter the policy they support. If we can do these things, no, we may not impact the national debate and discourse, but I think you can improve the quality of conversation in your social media, in your place of work, and you maybe even around your Thanksgiving table. (laughs) Think about that. If with grace and love and kindness, you could talk openly and honestly with those that you love the most. Wouldn't that be something to strive for? In closing, I I shared a couple weeks ago kind of my reasoning for having this two-part sermon. It it all stemmed back from Wednesday, November 9th, the day after the last presidential election. And I just found myself very disappointed by the discourse that was happening around me. And and, and, and I promised myself, I don't know if I can do anything, but I'm going to do what I, little old me, can to try to improve it the next time around. And and so I found myself hoping, dreaming for a better Wednesday (laughs) and a better day after an election for a country that can talk to one another, love one another in the midst of our disagreements and our political divisions. And I shared with you last week a little bit from this book, uh, I Think You're Wrong, But I'm Listening. It's, this is where the, the take off your jersey analogy comes from. And, and I want to close with, with uh, one more uh, statement in here. Uh, they share uh, a writing that they posted on a blog, and, and it, was, it was called Wednesday's Coming. And, uh, and so I, I, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I want to read how that that writing closes, they write this. People are complicated. People are more than our candidates of choice. People are more than our ideologies. People believe things for reasons we might not fully understand. Voting is the easiest exercise of our civic duty. The real work is in paying attention. It's in caring, communicating, and finding the best way to contribute from where we are. We can be the change we want to see in the world, and that's true no matter who wins. There will be a Wednesday, and we can choose to make Wednesday a day that we can be proud of. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this election season, let us live in such a way that Christ shines through us. And when Wednesday comes, May we carry out our lives in a way that makes God smile as we see ourselves not as opponents, but as beloved children of God, uniting together to build his kingdom here on earth. Amen.